Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Nuts and Bolts with Marquines. My name is Maria. Hi everyone. And today we're going to continue our series on secondary slash tertiary colors. <laughs> this time on green. The mm. color green. Sitting between yellow and blue. Mm -hmm. Well, as always, Maria, uh, the first thing that I like to talk about is associations. Mm -hmm. Because color has so many associations with the humans, us humans. <laughs> and the first, you know, when you close your eyes, everyone, you think of green, more likely than not, you are going to go to nature. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the fields of green that you've known, to the woodlands, but you might also go out to the sea. You also mm -hmm. might see those blue greens that are kind of almost grayish. Lake. So, lake. Yes. Yes. So more than any other color, Maria, green is mm -hmm. associated and has always been associated with nature. Yeah, I associate green with wellness and, and mm. health because it's also mm -hmm. the, the green foods we eat are good for you. Um, and just like being calm and being peaceful and being in nature. So mm -hmm. it's all about feeling good. And we say you relax your eyes when you look at greenery. Mm -hmm. So it's good for your eyes. So green to me is associated with wellness. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like I don't have as... Uh, intense emotional relationships to green like yes it, it doesn't evoke some intense emotions I don't know it is an so. interesting color in that regard other you know when you think about the other colors that we've addressed yeah. yellow red blue very strong associative powers in terms of emotions mm -hmm. but maybe because it is a calming sort of color association it's not as strong or powerful as a yellow or a red or even right. a blue uh, and a lot of artists avoid it altogether. Uh, Mondrian famously was a landscape painter in the first part of his career, used plenty of green. And then later in his abstractions, as he stripped away color and came back down to yellow, red, and blue, even wrote that green was an, an abomination. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> he really despised <laughs> green. So it's a funny color that way, that some people just avoid it altogether or use it very little. Others really celebrate it, and we'll take a look at that at some point in time as well. Uh, I myself like the color green, I use it, but um, it's something that I use usually, it, find, it usually it finds its way into my compositions later in the game. For mm. some reason, I don't introduce it right away. It, it finds itself in there a little bit later. I'm not even sure what that's about, <laughs> except for that it comes to, to, it comes to my parties a little bit later than a lot of the other colors, I'll put it that way. So we're gonna hop onto the mixing table um, in a moment. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned with the oranges, uh, we want to use this series on secondary and tertiary, tertiary color souls to revisit the idea of co-primary colors. So the warm and cool yellows, reds, and blues. So again, I'm gonna invite you all to go back to the videos on yellow, red, and blue if you want mm -hmm. to learn more about um, this idea of co-primary colors. And so today we're going to try two pairs. We're gonna to try to mix greens with warm and cool co-primaries, being a warm and cool yellow, yellow and, and blue. blue and see how different these greens are going to be, which is kind of fascinating. And if I can just add to that, uh, I think one of the most important things I want the painters out there to understand is the difference of our perception of green and of nature, actually, regarding the saturation levels of green, mm -hmm. whether it's going to be very intense, what that looks like and feels like, versus when it's muted or chromatic. And in fact, most of nature, when you go out and look at it, are chromatic grays of green, mm -hmm. not vibrant, saturated. And that's something that really startles people when they realize it. All right, let's okay. go jump into the palette and, and make some greens. Very good, all right. Okay, so can you just walk us through the colors yes. that we have? So here we have, this is Hansa Yellow Light. That's a cool yellow, which means that on the color light spectrum, it's already moving towards yellow grain. By comparison, I have a cad yellow dark here, and you can see that this yellow is already, if it were on the color light spectrum, moving towards yellow orange. That's why this is noted as a cool yellow and a warm yellow. There's also cad yellow medium and cad yellow light. I'm, happy to, I'm happening to choose this cad yellow dark. Now on the blues, I've got a phthalo blue with a green shade, 
very dark, rich blue. It's very cool. And I'm gonna combine these two for a green. And then this is an ultramarine blue, which I connote as a warm blue. And when these two come together, you're gonna to see a very different kind of green. And of course, white for adding tints later. So let's begin by just showing you the difference between these two yellows. I think that'll help just doing this. So here's that Hansa yellow light. Sometimes it's known as um, lemon yellow too. Some manufacturers will have it as, and there is the cad yellow dark. And you can see a big difference in those two. Now let's start adding small amounts of blue into this. I'm gonna add phthalo blue and get a number of results here. And then to this one, I'm gonna add ultramarine blue to get some different results. Later, I'll show what happens when we add a touch of white here or there. Okay, so as you're mixing that, I'm just gonna show here, we already mixed the um, greens with the cool yellow and the cool blue. And these are the results. So these are what you call prismatic. Um, highly, highly intense, highly saturated. Greens. And now we're gonna see what happens when you mix the warm yellow with a warm blue. I can already see. Big difference. It's gonna look different, so let's see. Okay, let's see that one. Mm -hmm. I'll bring it to life here. I always add white three times. I, I like to take it light three different times, both to see what happens with the tint, to see what happens with the value of it going lighter, but also with the saturation level. Because the more white I add, the less saturated or, or intense the color becomes. It desaturates it. It takes it from a muted hue to a chromatic gray. So that's why I always add it at least about three times. If for you, for you painters who like to work uh, in landscape, my advice is to really explore your muted greens and your chromatic greens. Because that's really, if you just go out into nature, take a hike today, for God's sake, go near the woods and start looking at those greens. And you'll see they, they are not that uh, intense. They, they are not looking like this. <laughs> Uh, now, a lot of painters use these colors to exaggerate the phenomena, and we'll look at some of those painters, and we'll look at some of those paintings, but quite frankly, now, you might think that this is getting close to white, but it's not. If I put white next to that color... She's right here. Mm -hmm. What a difference. Mm -hmm. This is a, a chromatic gray coming out of green uh, in a very light value, you see. Beautiful. Nice. Just beautiful. Right, so you can see here the difference in terms of saturation and intensity. But again, by adding white to any of these colors, you get this wonderful variety of these chromatic grays coming out of green where it's beginning to be desaturated or de-intensified. We're about to show you a number of artists and their paintings who use a variety of greens, everything from these really intense greens to these muted greens to the chromatic grays. The last thing I'd like to say here, Maria, for right now, is that um, when I've done the workshops with artists in the past, they realize, my God, Mark, I've got uh, 20 tubes of green in my studio. Yes, I can use them, but if you invest in the right yellows and the right blues with white, you can pretty much achieve most of those greens without having to buy tons of tubes that sit around. So that's my advice, actually, to experiment with yellow and blue plus white and see what you can get. You might be really pleasantly surprised. I don't think there's any movement in art history that celebrated the color green more so than the Impressionist and the Post-Impressionist. Why? They went out into nature, the mm -hmm. French landscape. Even the front title of this book speaks to that. When you look at the kinds of, in this particular painting here, the various greens, my goodness, this whole painting is just a riot of green, from the yellow greens to the dark greens, from the intense greens to the muted to the to the uh, pris excuse me to the chromatic grays. And as always, the artist would always play with warm notes 
either within the painting or juxtaposed to these cool notes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So most painters would celebrate green, but always have the warm notes in here to counter it beautifully, you see. Let's turn to just two artists in this book. There are so many to choose from. It was a hard choice for me to make because there were so many. But here we have one of my favorite painters, Cezanne. Here at this bridge, see, you'll see actually some of the hues that I just created, those dark greens. But also he has a wide variety from the lightest greens that get fairly intense because they're yellow greens to the muted greens to these chromatic grays, both light and dark. Notice again some warm notes within here. And then here we have Vincent Van Gogh. Some people say Van Gogh. This is a riot of green <laughs> ranging once again from these really intense saturated yellow greens into the muted greens and finally the chromatic gray greens. But again, notice the warm notes, Maria, throughout this mm -hmm. painting. It's really a beautiful riot of green. Okay. From there, I'd like to go to an American painter, one of my favorites, George Ennis, or Ennis, I never know exactly how to pronounce his name, but even this front cover, if you're not getting too much glare, there you go. Oh, yeah. You can see that beautiful sliver of that intense green set against all the other wonderful greens, and once again, the warm notes are there to sort of counter, if you will. I wanted to make a point about the juxtaposition of the warm notes to the cooler notes in these paintings. So I want to show this one painting by George in this, where he's got this fantastic array of greens. First, it's much more intense in the foreground and much more muted and even chromatic in the background. It sets the distance back. You see? And I love how they really resonate with these colors right. here. If you look at these, yes. and then up here, you're looking more at these kinds of colors. So that's the big point I'd like to make all day today is the difference of saturation and how it really matters in painting. But again, look how he has brought this beautiful note of blue in this woman's dress and he counters it with this red hat that this person's wearing. And once again, some warm notes here, Maria, of orange and orange here. Yes? Uh -huh. And I wanted to sort of juxtapose him with one of my other favorite painters, Fairfield Porter who's an American painter, mid, 20th, mid to late 18th, 20th century, mid to late 20th century, sorry. And here we have, that's a close-up, I'll show you the whole painting right here, uh, a portrait of these three individuals. And he's really got this very vibrant green. He brings it right up to here. And how, what does he do? He juxtaposes it with that red sweater uh. of the young girl there. And you can see how beautiful that works. So. There it becomes a very sort of intense note, uh, a field rather, that he sets up. And then he works the green into just a few other areas here, but he's really celebrating it beautifully. I think I've got maybe one other Fairfield port. Ah, look at this one here. Talk about the celebration of green. There's the entire painting. And then if you look at this fantastic close-up, you can see how he really celebrates green. As always in these videos, we would like to invite you, the artists out there, to experiment a little bit with greens, to mm -hmm. grab a um, different yellow, a um, couple of different yellows and blues, and see what you can achieve. And also, I'm curious about what kinds of greens you use in your artwork. Do you mix your greens? Do you buy them out of the tube? Maybe you buy a green out of the tube, but then you spice it up. Always. with some other colors anything um, possible. so what 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 is green for you in terms of associations but also how do you use them in your art yes and then you wanted to show your little uh, well uh, a while pride and joy. oh my pride <laughs> green and joy. pride and joy <laughs> well you know normally uh i don't do a, a a study like this this is a small study obviously maybe one day i'll do a larger painting mm -hmm. but i had the idea of i had all these green swatches what would happen if I cut them all up and made it almost a tapestry, if you will, almost like a quilt? There is a warm note right here in the midst of that in homage to some of the painters I was just mentioning. So yes, you could have fun with green and um, see where it takes you. Yep. Any last words to close it up? Well, we're heading into the winter months here in California where it's going to start to rain. So I would have yes. folks pay attention to the changing of the beans. hills. And I love when the first green sprouts come up because you mm -hmm. still see the warmth of the earth and then you get that green next to it. So 
Keep your eyes Keep open. your eyes on the green. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All you, everyone, right. for watching. Um, subscribe if you haven't done so. And uh, go back in history and look at the videos, especially the one on yellow, because you will have that notion of warm and cool co-primary colors explained. Yes. Good. All right. All right. Thanks. Be well.